So a lot of you really struggle at seeing these two things as the same thing. And let me tell you, this is a PLC and this is an OEM board and they are. Now, welcome to the What is DDC Tech Guides. This is the introduction into this series, fully available on the website. This video is free for you to use and it's also linked on the PDF, but the PDF is a physical form that you can review with visual aids to help you through this. Now getting into it, let's start with some basics here. What is DDC? DDC is Direct Digital Control. It really comes down to just using a processor like right here, or we can open this up and right here. So this is a PLC from like a VAV box. You would see just any troubleshoot, whether it's a disk tech, this is a automated logic, uh, this particular one, or you know it could be a Johnson Controls, a Honeywell, it could be any number of other brands. And this is a compressor control module straight out of a train. Uh, I believe it was an RTU, if I'm not mistaken. Both of these have a digital processor on them. And what really separates these from what we used to use is that processor itself and how we use it. IC is integrated controller. Uh, you can see this is an old solid state board. This is what we would have been using uh, prior to switching to a DDC4. Now this is a little out of an old ice machine I worked on some time. But there is no processor on here. This is strictly just little integrated control circuits and depending on what the input output does depends on what the board reacts to. But it has no physical programming, it's all done via how the these solid state circuits are done internally. When you see integrated controllers today, like on this board, this is really nothing more than just a programming chip. We call it an EEPROM. It's just for to tell the board uh, some real specific details, such as, you know, maybe what tonnage is it size for. Now, what makes this DDC setup worth it and why we went this drought is, well, you can do a whole lot more with that microprocessor and a much smaller platform you notice on here, there's a ton of the ICs. There's one processor with a couple of supporting ICs overall. So your ability for really precise control and also all you need here for programming is updating firmware. If you need to reprogram this, you have to rebuild the circuitry on the board to tell it to do something different based off of that. So I'm putting the term out there, PLC. All that means is a programmable logic controller. It's something that you can plug into in the field and you can load an actual program to it depending on what you want to do. Typically when we think of a PLC, we're thinking of a building management system or a plant management system and you've got to have some really fancy looking weird software that you can interface with this stuff and write and do code. And it can get pretty complicated. It's gotten a lot simpler over the years. You don't have to actually write code like you used to, but we'll get into that. Now this board over here is going to be considered an OEM PCB. Now PCB is just going to be printed circuit board and OEM is an original equipment manufacturer. So this is a board that the manufacturer, this particular case is Betrain, they physically put the programming in this board and they set it all up themselves. It's not something you did or a technician did in the field. So it becomes kind of a plug and play, but it's also going to serve a very specific purpose for what they wanted at that point. So what actually makes these different then? Well, it comes down to the physical boards themselves. They're meant for two kind of different things. This is very purpose built by the OEM, and this is very modular uh, so that it can fit a number of applications. And that's really the only physical differences. Other than that, it's the programming itself. Now, the programming, how it works, why it works, all that is essentially the same. The same principles apply regardless. The PLC is limited to the technician that's doing it. So however good that technician is and his ability to write that program uh, is gonna depend on how well this functions. Whereas the manufacturer will have an entire team dedicated to writing this program, testing it, vetting it out, now they still have their own issues and they, that's why firmware updates and things are even required to begin with. But to change the software in here, you're doing a firmware update, which in some cases may mean changing an EEPROM. Another huge strength to a DDC system, these boards are able to talk to each other. A PLC system is gonna talk with other things in the PLC system. Here, this is a communication terminal port where we can run a COM bus between all the different uh, b other boards in the network. So obviously a VAV as an example, there's a whole bunch of those in a building. 
but we can daisy chain all those together. Now these are typically going to be a RS-485 and you can either run a BACnet or a Modbus protocol. There are other forms of communication networks out there doing serial communication, that's okay. I'm not gonna get into every nitty gritty there. My point is the most common we're gonna deal with right now is gonna be that 485 with one of those two protocols. Now, many times the manufacturers will use a very similar or just a kind of an altered version that's very proprietary to them in their boards. So one of these terminals over here would be uh, the communication. There's gonna be another main board that's gonna be telling this board what it wants it to do based off of what the rest of the system is doing. So most 485 systems run just a two wire setup, which is what you see here. This board would have only required two wires of the 485 serial. There is an application where you would use four wires for the same things. And that's where your TX and RX are gonna come into play. TX would be transmit, RX would be receive, and they're gonna have a negative positive. And if you're not completely sure what I mean by daisy chain is they're literally just connecting in and there'll be one set of wires coming from another controller landing. And then that same terminal, there'll be a separate set of wires. So two wires will land in that same terminal point and it'll go on to the uh, next controller uh, in the branch. Now I've brought up IO several times and I've, I've said the term inputs outputs. Really that is the nervous system of this entire ecosystem. We still had IO when we were dealing with a solid state. You know, these terminal points here, they were controlling different things. All of this was, would have been IO. Essentially, what the control boards are doing is it's using the inputs to see what's happening. That is its ability to monitor the system. And then it's going to use the outputs to control the system and manipulate it so that it can make whatever set points that it has. A basic thermostat has the exact same thing. It has an, an eye, an input for temperature, and then depending on what you set that temperature to, uh, depends on what it does with the outputs, which is your you know, cooling, heating, Y1, W1. So breaking this down to just a bare thermostat, just Honeywell, whatever thermostat, we're doing the exact same thing. This just has more of those temperature sensors involved or maybe some other sensors, same thing here. And these have more ability to have output control where a thermostat is, it's just, it's a much smaller package and it's much more purpose built. What are some different input or output devices? One input device may be a set of CT rings. So this is just strictly for current sensing. So these would wire into a set of inputs on a control board. And this gives us the ability to monitor our fan current or our compressor current, whatever we're trying to read, it doesn't really matter. This is how we can do that. Now, another option would be like this potentiometer, which is a PRV positioning sensor that's going to tell us what position our guide vanes are in on the chiller. Ultimately, it's just an input device. It's, it's feeding back a signal so the controller knows where that position is at and it can determine what it wants to do from there. Now, some really common output devices, well, you see one of them, this here, this actuator for the damper control, this is just another output device. So there is just a set of terminal wires that's running between the control board and the actuator, and that's all it needs. Another example you're probably familiar with, Honeywell actuator, output device. We should all know about a solenoid coil. Solenoid coil is just an output. It's just gonna wire in. Great, you've got your field wiring, but it's just gonna land down here we're gonna close across a set of terminals and give power to this coil so they activate a liquid line solenoid. But let's take this a little further. Some other input devices, something like a flow switch input device, something like a, a feedback from the VFD for speed, that's an input. But some more examples of outputs would be your VFD speed reference and how we're controlling that fan speed or the pump speed it would be your compressor contactor starts, or just maybe it's basic relays or something along those lines. All of those would be considered outputs. By the way, CSG, they're gonna be sponsoring this video. Really appreciate those guys. They've been a great supporter of the brand of the entire system and operation I got going on here. They're Compressor Solutions Group based out of Houston, Texas. If you ever need any kind of compressor support for parts or you know screw compressor remanufacturing, resips, 
anything of that nature, reach out to them, let them know that you're interested, you need some help, maybe you need some support. They also offer some compressor tech support for their customers, just putting that out there. Let Jake over there know that you need assistance. Links for all this will be in the description. Okay, so we don't have too much further to go on this. We're almost done. This first one's gonna be a bit more in-depth and lengthy, just given uh, this is an intro to a pretty serious and broad topic, so we're gonna take some time on it. In future tech guides, we're gonna break these things down into their more simple forms, and we're not gonna be so general and broad scale. This initial one is to, to truly get you started in this conversation. So the next thing on the list is gonna be our programming. The programming for this is just, it's, just, it's a logic sequence. It is a series of inputs connected together in a algorithm, which then turns into a series of outputs depending on what you want to happen. It's not that complicated really, and it's usually referred to as an and or style uh, sequence. There's more to it than that. I'm really trying to simplify it here. When you were dealing with a solid state style, style board, you know, your wiring actually played a huge part of your logic sequence. For example, your low pressure switch and high pressure switch on a basic residential system, it would have the, uh, the switches wired in series with the output for the Y1. And so you then turn those physical switches into a physical form of logic and it's a safety logic. So the output would send compressor Y1 start, right? So we're asking the compressor to turn on, but then once it leaves the board before it can get to the contactor, it's got to first pass through those safeties. So it's just a physical form of logic. With a DDC system, typically that low pressure switch is going to come in on its own set of inputs. And then the high pressure switch is going to come in on a separate set of inputs. Then the programming in here is going to be able to see those inputs and decide that, okay, my safeties are happy. They're closed. No issues here. So I'm going to allow my output to Y1. Let me read something straight from the what I wrote here as an example. If the thermostat is calling for Y1 on DI1 and the low pressure safety is closed on DI2 and the 180 seconds short cycle timer is at zero seconds, then DO1 can close for the compressor start. That is an example of how a DDC system will take multiple inputs and allow for uh, that to be read as an output in, a, in basically virtual wiring. You can think of it like that. And that's, uh, that's how I'm looking at trying to, to convey this to you uh, as we work through this is they're virtual wires that are connected together. And this will make way more sense as we start getting into more of the logic side of this process. For what I just described, we've got a thermostat asking this board to turn on the compressor, which is Y1, and then we're just checking a safety. Safety says I'm closed, and then we have an internal timer, which is the virtual thing. So when that timer is at zero so that we don't short cycle, then we'll allow the compressor to turn on. I just want to clarify, DI1, DO, digital input, digital output, you also have AI, AO, We'll get into those things. That's a, that's a later form diving into inputs and outputs. The last and probably one of the more difficult and controversial pieces is a PID, Proportional Integral Derivative Control Logic. Now a PID or a PID for short, it's just an, a type of algorithm that we use in order to, to pull all this together to make a control but it's specifically designed for variable control of an output, just meaning that we can use this algorithm with a set of inputs to then change on a variable scale. It's not just an off or an on. Now in the most simplest of terms, proportional, the P, is just strictly the, the difference between your set point and your actual reading. So we're looking at that difference to help influence what that algorithm is going to do for the output. Your integral is how fast that algorithm is going to respond based on your proportional. So the, f the, higher, the larger the proportional number is, the more dramatic a response that should be needed for it. And then the derivative is a correction factor. It's a means of kind of trying to slow down the integral to gently ease in the proportional so that they all kind of gently touch down, if you will, like a plane 
trying to come down for a landing almost. And, and so that way we don't overshoot. You know, if the plane comes down too hard and heavy, it just crashes and people, people that didn't work out so well. So with, with what we're trying to do with that derivative is let the plane gently come down, touch down, and maybe there's a slight bump. Maybe we just barely overshoot the set point a little bit, but overall, we have a fairly gentle landing and uh, our, our set points are satisfied and happy and we're able to maintain that output at a certain level to keep everything just right there where we want it. And that is just a really basic idea of what a PID is doing. And we use PIDs absolutely everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Varying the actuators we use to control CFM through our VAV box or controlling our VFD for a fan or a pump flow. A supply air set point where we're staging compressors. Now that may be several compressors we're turning on, but that stop start portion of that and what dictates that is it comes back to a, a pit. So you see a system that is further from set point, you're going to see it react and want to ramp up to satisfy that set point really quickly. But then you're going to notice that as you get close to set point, it's going to get a lot slower in how it reacts, why it reacts, and it's, it's you're not going to see so much happening. When you're several degrees away from set point, that system may stage rapidly and bring on a whole bunch. Sometimes, it, if, especially if it's got a really fast PID, it'll overstage, which will cause an overshoot. And then it's got to unload all of that in order to draw back in and, and catch that set point right where you want it and try to cruise at that point. Because ideally, a PID really helps us be a lot more efficient and effective with controlling our output to keep our supply air temp or our, our water temps or whatever it is we're doing with it at a very specific point. So that will wrap up this companion video to the What is DDC Tech Guide. You can get those tech guides in a PDF form through the website at hvactime.shop. So on there you'll find version 1.0 as things need to be modified, adjusted, or maybe somebody notices something that I missed in the making of this, they can I can go in and correct it there on that form and you're gonna see the most up to date. There's gonna be pictures and examples and everything that you need to try to understand this as best you can. And this is the, that form is something that one, you can read, you learn a lot better when you are able to read something more than just hear it or, or see it. Uh, or you can put these two things together, watch this video, and you always have this to reference back to, but if you're standing on the job site and you're trying to uh, remember this thing or you're, 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 just, you're getting hung up, maybe you need just a little bit of a jolt, then these tech guides are gonna help you do that. And these are gonna be meant to be troubleshooting guides that you can carry with you. And this is gonna be a collection and a series of these that come out. And these are separate from the tech sheets. The tech sheets are high-end, just in-depth technical stuff on specific equipment. These tech guides are gonna be more general based depending on what you're troubleshooting. So we'll do things on each output device. We'll talk about input devices. I'll do some on the logic themselves. I'll do some on the communication, but it's gonna help break down each piece of this process and allow you to uh, have a physical form so that when you're in that spot where there is no signal and you, you don't have, you can't call out like, You've got no options other than what's in front of you with no cell service. This is a form that can be saved to your phone that you can just pull up, you can read, you can see the visual aids, and maybe it'll be a, a little nugget of something to get you over the edge of what you're dealing with. Either way, I appreciate it guys. MTT, take care of your family, take care of your spouse, take care of yourself. I'll see you around.